Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, how you doing? I'm good, Nick. How are you? I'm doing good, man. You ready for another AMA? Sure am. All right. Well, this one I think is on a topic you're a little more excited about than maybe the fruits and vegetables one, um, looking at exercise. So there's been no shortage of things that you've spoken about exercise and how positive you are on it. You know, you've often talked about how it's one of the most potent things we have um, in the toolkit for longevity. And whenever you talk about it, we get a lot of questions from subscribers, a lot of people wondering, you know, how should they think about exercise? Like what is the optimal dose of exercise for longevity? And I think we see this anytime we do an exercise podcast because, you know, you have your four pillars of exercise. And so people are always wondering, like, how do I get everything in? How much should I be working out? I think some of the confusion can also come from, you know, past guests maybe having different opinions. I think when you look at the literature, it also doesn't quite agree with each other. You know, so if you take someone like Alex Hutchinson and you take maybe the AMA you and Bob did on VO2 max and you talked about how important that was, and then you have a podcast like we did with James O'Keefe where he and his research talks about a J curve, you know, it's kind of hard for subscribers at times to understand the literature, right? How do you get an elite VO2 max when some of the other research says the best thing you can do is play badminton. You know, those two things don't quite add up. And so what we did for this one is we compiled all these questions around this to really try and answer the core question, which is what is the optimal dose of exercise for longevity? And quick disclaimer is we're not looking at what is the minimum dose, which I think gets written about a lot. And I know we've done weekly emails kind of responding to articles that are like, you know, 10,000 steps, 10 minutes of walking a day, all these little things are all you need to do. So we're going to kind of focus on that core question is like, what is the optimum dose? So before we get into kind of those types of questions that we compiled, anything you want to add to what I just said to set the stage? Yeah, I would add that we're also going to explore, uh, it, can you do too much? Because most things in biology sort of occupy a Goldilocks space, not too much, not too little. Um, I think, you know, clearly that's the case with nutrition, too much nutrition, just look around you, too little nutrition. Well, that's frankly the problem that, you know, lots, lots of part of the world, lots of parts of the world still experience and have historically experienced a lot of. So, you know, with exercise, I think that's less clear. Uh, and that's a topic we also want to really get into today. And even if that's not relevant to the majority of the population, in other words, even if majority of people aren't in the situation where they're butting up against potential limits of exercise in terms of crossing from being benefit to risk, um, I think it's a very important question nevertheless. Uh, and it might speak to some of the, the, the mechanistic insights around exercise. And of course, for those people who do want to kind of push the limits, um, it, it, it probably gives us some insight as well. Yeah. So maybe we just start with kind of one of the first questions and it's something that you've covered before, so we don't have to go into it in an insane amount of detail, but I think it might be helpful for people just to set the stage on why they should care about this and why it's worth putting in the time to exercise, you know, so how is exercise so beneficial, not only for our health span, but also for our lifespan. And you kind of tried to summarize it in a cartoon you put on Instagram the other week at this point, which kind of looked at the guy in the doctor's office and the doctor asked him like, what would you rather do exercise one hour a day or be dead 24 hours a day? And so anything that you can kind of do to set the stage on why this is so important and why people should make the time for it, should put the effort into understand this. Well, to, you know, to your point, I, I think at this point, it there's really no need to spend time discussing this um, beyond just stating that regardless of which chronic disease you're looking at, whether it be ASCVD, cancer, type two diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, all cause mortality, it doesn't matter. Exercise is going to reduce the toll of mortality across all of those things. The mechanisms by which it does it can be interesting, right? So it can, you know, 
improve lipids. It can reduce inflammatory markers. It can reduce uh, flow-mediated shear stress in arteries. Um, you know, I think in cancer, truly, it's a little bit less clear. I suspect much of the benefit in cancer comes through the metabolic benefits that, of, of exercise. So um, we know, for example, that the second leading environmental or modifiable risk of cancer after smoking is, in fact, obesity. Um, and as I have probably talked about in other podcasts, I think it's really less the adiposity of obesity that's the problem and the metabolic consequences of obesity that are found in many but not all obese uh, patients. Um, obviously, diabetes is, is probably one of the most clear places where you just dramatically see an improvement. And this, of course, has to do with um, glucose disposal and insulin sensitivity within the muscle. And again, I think the list just goes on and on and on, but there, there really isn't any ambiguity here. Uh, and, and again, we should, we should sort of celebrate this fact because there's a ton of ambiguity in a lot of things that pertain to lifespan and health span. It's actually nice for once to have a slam dunk. Yeah, definitely. So I think what would also be helpful for people is another term I've heard you mention before internally as you think about your exercise and how you kind of plot out how you tackle this problem is METs. So do you want to let people know what a MET is and then why it can be beneficial in looking at a variety of different exercises? Yeah, so I, I do talk about it a little bit. Um, and I think most people have kind of heard of this idea of a metabolic equivalent or a MET. Um, and it's basically an energy currency, right? So we in the body, we think about energy currency and sort of ATP, but you know, that's on such a cellular level. This is kind of a global way to think about it. Um, now, a, a MET, a single MET, one MET is uh, the energy cost of being alive at rest. Uh, so obviously not a whole lot. Um, worth noting that one MET is equivalent to 3.5 milliliters per minute per kilogram of oxygen utilization. And that relationship, for the most part, just holds. So in other words, if you are doing 10 METs of exercise, you are consuming 35 milliliters of oxygen per minute. And that becomes relevant as we start to think about VO2 max. Now, when you want to get a sense of what certain activities look like, and again, so much of what we talked about on this podcast, uh, even what we've already gone through, like I sort of glossed over some of the details of the benefits of exercise in the show notes, we will include so much on that so that if you really want to go deep on every single but, you know, aspect of health span and lifespan and the mechanism for each, we, we've got all of that in great references. Um, but again, when you want to think about how many METs do you get doing various things? Well, again, sitting there doing nothing is one MET. Um, you know, walking your dog might be three METs. Going, going for a slow bike ride, kind of like 10 miles an hour or less, four METs. Mowing your lawn might be five and a half METs. Playing golf, four and a half METs. Uh, you know, resistance training vigorously, six METs. So you kind of get a sense. Now, you know, where does this go? Well, so, so you know, rowing at 100 watts, which really isn't that much of a killer effort, you're at seven watts, uh, pardon me, at seven METs. Um, now you can look at the speed change, right? So once you're running six miles an hour, which is a 10 minute mile, and that's still a jog, you're almost at 10 METs at that point. Once you're running 10 miles an hour, six minute mile, this is a pace that you know, a fit person can hold for a while, but but most people couldn't hold for very long. You're at about 14 and a half METs. So you, you get the sense of the non-linearity of this, right? Um, meaning, you know, 14 METs versus seven METs, you wouldn't hold seven METs for, or you wouldn't hold 14 METs for half the time you'd hold seven METs. Yeah. And just to double click on it, that's the METs you get per activity is per an hour of activity. So if you no, say you're... No, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, in a moment, like, you know, so you would say uh, it, it's all normalized per time. So if, if you're running, you know, a six, if you're running a six minute mile pace for an hour, we would say you did 14 and a half MET hours of work. 
So here's the way to think about it. It's the difference between watts and joules. If you think about it. if anyone who's a cyclist will, will think of things that way, right? So on a bike, your power meter tells you instantaneously how much work you're doing. That's wattage, uh, that's, which is really joules per second. And then you multiply that over the total time that you do it, you, you take it back to total energy. So um, the met is an instantaneous measurement and you normalize it over time to give the total volume. So the work that's done is really the met hour. So for example, um, you know, if you, I don't know, do a, do a, a hike for six, that's six Mets worth of activity, uh, or six Mets worth of exertion, and you do it for 45 minutes, that would be four Met hours of work done. Yeah. So Peter, when people think about their Mets, how, like, how is it that knowing how many Met hours you're putting out, how is that helpful to someone as they think about exercise on a whole? You know, look, I think for most people, it's not truthfully. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who tracks my met hours per week. And I, I don't spend like, I don't do it down to the Nat's ass. I just mean, I have a spreadsheet where I'm basically putting in my activity, the amount of time I spend doing it at various different intensities. And I can at the end of the week say, look, I'm doing, you know, 100 met hours per week. Um, during this phase of my training, during this phase of my training, it might be 80 you know, back in the old days, it was 200 met hours per week. It was, you know, a, a much, much greater workload. Um, if you're doing one thing that's tied to a power meter, like in cycling, you know, we tend to keep track of kilojoules and normalize power and power. So, so all of these things are just sort of ways to track the work you're doing. Now, I think it partially becomes relevant when you want to evaluate the research because the research, you know, has to be able to take into account, not just how much time you're exercising, but what's the intensity of that exercise? You know, it would be very difficult to provide guidance if we didn't know this. For example, do we want to say just the amount of distance you run a week tells us everything we need to know? Are two people who are running 15 miles per week experiencing the same metabolic uh, benefit or harm? Well, certainly not, right? One could be running them all at 10 minute mile pace one might be, I mean, just imagining this, one might be running them all as 400 all out repeats. So, you know, you have to have some way to kind of normalize that. Um, and in the case of the latter, you know, you would probably see a much higher met hour because of the intensity. Yeah. And so with that kind of background, now we're going to kind of get to the core of what we get asked about. And so the first kind of question is, like we often get asked is, to the best of our knowledge, are we able, even able to say if there is a minimum efficient or most effective dose of exercise when you look at med hours per week? Is that something that is that is that our understanding? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed. The Qualies, which were a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. 
This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.